So it's a real honor to have Francisco here. I think we've, I've been trying to get him to this conference for three years now. And finally, we uh, got, uh, got the Erlang and Elixir conference this year as well as Francisco. So it comes, you know, that's the trick. You need to get both of them together. Uh, so finally, we've managed that. Uh, I mean, I don't think anyone needs introduction to Francisco. Everyone knows his contribution right from the beginning of Erlang days to what he's doing right now with Erlang Solutions. So it's a real honor to have you here, and thank you very much. Thank you. It was uh, really appropriate to get all of the speakers up uh, for a picture, and I wish they could have stayed up here, because you know, throughout the whole day today, I've been hearing everyone talk about what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> and <laughs> but it's so, yeah, I was in a debate whether you know, I should maybe start or finish it off, but at least, well, we'll, well, finishing it off might work. So a quick question. How many of you actually do uh, functional programming on a day-to-day -day basis? Or actually use a functional programming language? OK. And uh, how many of you don't use a functional programming at work? Functional programming. OK. So th th that's about 40, 50. Now, and the reason I'm saying it is you know, we run a conference called Code Mesh in London. And one of the questions we asked the delegates was, will you have any use about what you've learned uh, at this conference in your day job. And the first time I got the feedback and the results, I freaked out because 50% said they would have no use of what they had learned in their day-to-day -day job. And I'm just and, uh, panicked. And I went in and quickly looked at you know, the feedback on the talks. And it was amazing. You know, it, the, the feedback was some of the best feedback I'd ever seen at any conference. And yeah, and I think you know, everyone was there to actually learn something new. And you know, this is you know, what I'm going to talk about is, well, looking at how functional programming is actually influencing uh, us on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, just look at Java 8. Look at the functional paradigms which have come in. Look at you know, yet those who listened to my talk yesterday understood how functional program actually influenced Erlang after Erlang had come out with Phil Wadler convincing Joe Armstrong to add lambdas and you know, to add list comprehensions as well, to sneak in lambdas and list comprehensions into the language. So, I mean, my, my journey with functional programming started in 1991. And you know, it was, um, we, they taught us ML in university. It was the second language uh, they taught us. It was four weeks into my computer science degree. That's when they slammed down the first book. I was speaking to someone, one of the delegates outside earlier. Oh, yeah, Sweden's pretty strong on functional programming. Just like, yes. And, uh, but the real love affair, I think, with functional programming started uh, three years later. It started in 1994. So I was taking the parallel programming course at uh, Uppsala University. And the lecturer came in, and he waved this book out. I don't know how many of you have actually seen a picture of it, let alone you know, held a copy of this book. This was you know, the very first. Oh, We've got one of the co-authors in the back, yes, one of the three co-authors in the back. Robert, this was one of the most expensive books I've ever bought, <laughs> right? Um, so he waved this book and said, this is the book, read it. Then he took a bunch of exercises, these are the exercises, shoved them, on the, shoved them on the book and said, do them. And that was pretty much all we heard, you know, Erlang being mentioned. That's all we heard about Erlang for the rest of the course. Uh, instead, you know, off you know, he went and lectured about the horrors of parallel programming. Now, the exercises you know, consisted of a, uh, of a simulation. So we had to do the graphical part in Tickle TK, and we had to do the back end in Erlang. And you know, the exercise was a simulation where you know, we had a rabbit, uh, rabbits going around. Rabbits would go around looking for carrot patches. And then we had wolves going around hunting the rabbits. Uh, wolves and rabbits had to display some form of intelligence. So if a rabbit found a carrot patch, it'd go in and broadcast to all the other rabbits, hey, there are carrots over here. And the wolves, you know, whenever they saw a rabbit, they'd broadcast all the wolves within a certain radius, hey, there's food here, you know, come eat. And when the rabbits saw a wolf, they'd you know, shout fire or shout danger to all the other, well, rabbits within their vicinity. And so they'd start running away. And the goal was to create a balanced world. Every, 
every uh, uh, rabbit was a process, every wolf was a process, every carriage pack was, was a process. And it was really, really fun to watch. Uh, it was, you know, the, the intelligence displayed was, well, questionable. I think this was kind of the first array. You know, so you had a rabbit running away from a wolf straight into a pack of wolves and then it would start running back, and then it would just freeze, and then, yeah, it, it was fun to watch. Now, what was interesting in it is, I remember actually going in and, you know, typing PS minus EF. At the time, we were doing this lab on a deck workstation, which could have, which had, uh, yeah, at the time, could, they always could handle a maximum of 16, possibly 32 threads. And I remember going in and typing PS minus EF, and seeing, I think it was four threads running. One was the editor, Emacs, uh, running in VI mode. The other was the clock. The third was the shell, and the fourth was the jam. So that was the virtual machine we used at the time, Joe's abstract machine. A and thinking, oh, cool, you know, because I would have expected a thread for every rabbit, for every, you know, for every wolf, and for every carrot patch, but that wasn't the case. And what you know, and, and, and you know, I, I didn't really quite connect and understand, you know, why was the lecturer telling us about the horrors of parallel programming? They were teaching us about threads and shared memory and how your shared memory gets corrupted, uh, you know, when, yeah, when you don't do things properly and how you needed locks and mutexes and then how locks and mutexes then resulted in, in deadlocks. And none of this happened when we were doing the labs. None of it at all. And yeah, I, I thought, didn't think that much about it. I was just like, I passed, I was happy, kind of moved on. And it wasn't until probably 10 years later, at least 10 years later, if not more, when I heard Simon Peyton Jones uh, give a talk. And what he said is, oh, the future of you know, concurrent languages is going to be functional. They might not be called functional, but the features will definitely be from functional programming. And that's when I started thinking back about you know, this particular exercise. And I think what I just experienced was the fact that you, know, you could have mutable state and immutable state. So concurrency models based on the two. Our lecturer was talking about concurrency models based on mutable state. Uh, and we were actually doing labs with concurrency models based on immutable state. And it, it, it's, uh, you know, it, 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 it took a long, long time to actually realize the importance of immutable state and what it, you know, the benefits it gave us. Uh, so much that, you know, I, I, I need to come clean. I actually even joked about it at some point. I mean, this was seven years ago, September 2010. And, you know, and I'll flash this out because, as we know today, with Donald Trump, every time he tweets, if you go back in the archives, you'll find some other tweet he's forgotten to delete, which says the complete opposite. So, yeah, I, I thought I'd rather be honest. But, you know, what, what, you know, if we think, what, what, what is immutability? Um, you know, when, when you were in high school, university, and you studied differential equations, so algebra, lambda calculus, geometry, or whatnot, this is what they taught you. They said y is equal to x squared minus 1, and, and then you, you did, went in and did whatever it had to do. And you know, immutable state is basically the idea is that you can share what you can share and copy what you can share. So copying basically becomes a way of sharing. And immutability basically meant that you, know, you can share data across processes without the risk of you know, anyone actually going in and changing that data once you've actually shared it. And you know, that, was, you know, that was the secret source. That was the weapon which we were using when you're know, doing the simulation. And you know, if you don't have any shared memory, you need immutable data structures. You know, that is, it's a requirement when you're actually doing it. Um, you know, this is what they now teach you when you take your computer science degree. Uh, this is immutability. And this does not come natural. This defies everything else they've taught us when we did, did maths. And you know, the idea you know, with mutability is you mutate something, you change something. What you do is you maybe keep the common bits and change the parts which, which need adapting, and you create a new data structure which you know, gets, you know, remains in the same memory spot. And yeah, this is wrong. This is, yeah, this is not the way it should be. Um, you know, now, of, of course, you know, by being immutable, 
your languages must have side effects. There must be some element of immutability, but it has to be controlled. And I think probably Haskell is the purest of all the languages. Uh, was a talk in this very room not so long ago, well, I think two hours ago, about exactly monads. You know, that's how you do it. Uh, there was a great talk this morning about Rust, and how about Rust allows you to switch from mutability to immutable state back to immutable state. Uh, in Erlang, we, the way we do it is with ETS tables, with message passing, or through I.O. So, you know, the, you, you need some form of immu immutability, sorry, in any programming language, else, you know, the, the only use you will have of your computer is basically, you know, you'll run your CPU, your cores at 100%, and, you know, you can use in cold countries at least to heat up your house. But, you know, you won't get any use out of it otherwise. And, you know, if you have threads, you know, shared memory is fine. Uh, as long as you keep the shared memory or the mutable state within the thread. But as soon as you start dealing with your know, multiple threads, obviously you need to have that thread display immutability, and you need to copy the data from one thread to another. So you know, what we learned is, yeah, that there are two ways of doing concurrency. So if you look at, you know, with mutability, uh, you know, what happens right here if your program crashes whilst you're executing the critical section? goes bang, it explodes, and your memory all of a sudden gets completely corrupted. You don't know what state you've left your memory, and that means going in and terminating all of the threads which might have some form of an access to that memory. The other problem with mutability is locality. You know, assume we've got a process running in London, we've got one running here in Bangalore. Where do we locate our shared memory? Let's assume Dubai. Uh, let's assume Dubai, which is kind of halfway in between. Uh, we now need yeah, to access that shared memory, which adds latency, which has a huge cost to it. And not only, what happens if your connectivity goes down? And you know, it's not if your connectivity goes down, it's when your connectivity goes down. And I've said this before, you know, there are three certainties here in life. The first is you know, taxes, death, and network issues, network partitions. <laughs> and, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's not if but when. Now, you know, shared memory with mutability will work, but it will only work on a single machine, assuming nothing goes wrong. And I'm not dissing you know, uh, mutable state. There is a very, very big important need for it, and there are use cases for it where it is critical and you must have it. Uh, concurrence is not one of them. If you've got immutable state, so basically where you know, you've got two processes, they don't share memory, and they communicate with each other through message passing, uh, something goes wrong, your state doesn't get corrupted because you will lose the state of the process which terminated, but you know, the process which is running will keep on running because it's got its own copy of the data. That's, you know, that, that's really pretty, that's pretty important. And not only, but it was most likely a corrupt state which caused the process on the right-hand side here to terminate in the first place. So by terminating the process and getting rid of the state, you, you hopefully solve the problem. Uh, locality, well, you don't locate state, you copy it. So you know, if you're running a process in London and one in Bangalore, each process will, sh will have its own copy of the data. It's, yeah, will work pretty, you know, it's gonna be pretty straightforward. And finally, if your network connectivity fails, <coughs> e yeah, each process will continue running. They've got the data they need to continue running. What's important is that when the network connectivity comes back up again, your data needs to converge back. And yeah, there are libraries you can use for that. There are CRDTs, or data types. There are you know, distributed databases which, which you can use. So I, once again, I, Step back a second, and I, I got inspired this morning. Oh, sorry. Okay, no, sorry. Yeah. Now I'm to, I'm calling it mutable state and immutable state here. And some people, you know, before some of you start jumping up and down, uh, you know, mutable state and immutable state could also be, you know, if you step back, you can also call it shared memory and no shared memory. And the reason I'm calling it mutable and immutable is that you can actually implement a no shared memory approach with mutable state. So, you know, that, that, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm right. And, and you yeah, know, once again, if you do that, I mentioned it earlier, the right approach is, you know, to 
uh, yeah, if you're using mutable state, is to hide the mutability within a browser within a thread. Now, you saw this earlier today, and once again, I was, uh, yeah, not quite right to, yeah, maybe post such a picture of pork sausages in, uh, yeah, in a country which is uh, strictly vegetarian, mainly vegetarian, but um, every time I go to one of Martin's talks, I get blown away. I, I really, uh, you know, the same applies to any talks by Victor Klang and Jonas Bonner, and, um, you know, it, it's the first I've actually heard Martin speak, uh, and the first time I met him was probably five or six years ago in London, and I was in the back of the room jumping up and down. He was, uh, of excitement, out of excitement. He was describing how he was getting Java and the JVM to scale on multi-core architectures. But, you know, what he was describing was the Erlang model of programming, you know, the way, you know, we had always done it. He himself, well, would call it functional, the functional paradigm. And, uh, you know, and, and he was coding it in Java. And, you know, in my view, you know, the JVM are his sausages, if you ask him. And, you know, he, he went in and said, well, you know, functional data structures are like sausages. The more you see them uh, being made, the less you will sleep. And th this might be his world. This is my world. Um, it's uh, seasoned grilled tofu. So not only is it vegetarian, it's actually vegan. And much, much healthier to consume. You know, this is the Beam virtual machine. I do not try to force, you know, functional paradigms on a virtual machine which was implemented, uh, you know, for, for speed. That's what the JVM was implemented for, for speed and for parallelism. I use a you know, VM which was implemented for concurrency and full tolerance and soft real time. And, you know, it, it was built for immutable state. It's no secret, you know, Jonas, that there is a, um, there, there is a, a computer Sweden in Sweden, uh, computer Sweden, so the number one computing magazine in Sweden, every year publishes a list of, you know, the top 10 programmers in the country. Jonas Bonner makes that list, you know, almost every year. Ma often he's number one. If there was a similar list in London, you know, Martin would be on that list as well. Uh, you need a brain the size of a planet, and you need to be a really, really good programmer to do what they're doing on the JVM. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, I instead, you know, use a VM uh, with programming language semantics, you know, built around mut mutable state. What does it do for me? It results in less code, you know, less errors, and, you know, much easier code to support and maintain. It, it, it makes it so, so much easier. And so, so much for tofu. You know, now, now that we have a concurrency model you know, based on immutable state, this by default leads us into distribution. Um, you know, distribution, all it does is, you know, you've got a concurrent model based on immutable state. All distribution does is it abstracts where you're actually executing your code. That's all it does. And all distribution does is, you know, slow down the computation of a single process through latency because it will take a little bit longer you know, to, to communicate with that process and get back the result. But you now you know, spread that computation, parallelize it, and spread it on 10 different machines, all of a sudden it's going to go much, much faster. So you might lose out on a single uh, computation, but multiple in parallel, uh, you speed it up. And when latency matters, it's really important you get latency under control, that you monitor it. But when it matters, you know, there is, once again, research being done around it. There's edge computing. And all of a sudden, your locality and affinity become very, very critical in your choices. So talking about distribution, you know, it's time to you know, kind of come up with another really important um, functional programming uh, paradigm, uh, you know, that of lambdas and closures. So it's high order functions, you know, lambdas and closures, which actually make the abstraction levels work. Uh, you start thinking of all your scaffolding and infrastructure which will give you your, your concurrency. So you know, start thinking of ACA or start thinking of uh, uh, OTP.net. You know, start thinking of, well, the airline style concurrency. Or start thinking about your distribution framework. It doesn't really matter. You know, the, the, the two go hand in hand. And what you do is you implement your functionality enclosures, and that allows you to go in and start shifting around functionality, without even having to be aware of it when you start off your system and you run it. 
which becomes really, really critical. And I think there are the best examples I can give of this is you go back, uh, you know, every year we are storing, you know, hard disks are becoming cheaper and cheaper, and, you know, big data is the craze, or at least was a craze not, that, you know, not a couple of years ago. We are now storing every year more data than all of the previous years put together. And I'm starting to count from your cave paintings. So every, you know, since we started recording things in history for cave paintings, every year we're storing more and more data. And, you know, what's happening there? Well, we're actually, you know, it's becoming really expensive now to start moving this data. Uh, you know, network bandwidth, uh, hard drives and whatnot. So the compute is actually being moved to the data. And how do you move compute to the data? Well, lambdas and closures. And it will work because you have local data and you're not sharing it. So, you know, lambdas and closures, I'll come back to that later. But now, now that we've got that, you know, here are just two uh, embedded devices. On the left is a parallela board. I don't know how many of you have heard of Adaptiva, but they've got a dual core ARM processor and an epiphany uh, core, uh, an epiphany coprocessor. The epiphany coprocessor has either 16 or 64 cores. The 16 core one costs, I think, about 100 bucks. The 64 core one, two, 300, 300 bucks. And it consumes about three to four watts of energy. So be clear, it's a coprocessor, so it's not a main processor. Now, you need to access all of the cores individually, and the cores don't share memory, and they can only communicate with uh, the ARM processor. Does that sound come? Yeah, this is a little point of familiarity here. On the right hand side is an old Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pi 2. I think we're at number three right now, but 2015, Raspberry Pi went multi core and they started shipping with a quad core um, ARM processor. So, you know, that was two years ago. So, you know, we've got uh, multi core in embedded devices. Uh, Let's take it to the other end. You know, in 1980, a Cray 2 was considered a supercomputer. iPhones have much, much more processing power than a supercomputer from, you know, from the 80s. Uh, the fastest computers in the world, uh, the Sunway um, Tihao Light, uh, from the Chinese National University of Defense Technology. Uh, it gives you about 93 trillion floating point operations per second and consists of 10 million cores. I'm sure the NSA has a much, much faster computer than this, but I don't think they'll run up to it. If we've got any American friends here who can confirm it, please do. But um, what you know, the Raspberry Pi and the Parallela board and you know, supercomputers have in common is the whole concept of you know, heterogeneous cores. And you know, very soon, your know, future architects will have CPUs, your know, GPUs, you know, they'll have you know, graphical cores, your know, heavyweight CPUs, lightweight integer units, DSPs, you know, cores for security, NOx, which is a, a network on a chip. I.O. and soft cores and so on. Pretty much, you know, the shift to multi-core is inevitable. And parallelizing legacy C or Java code is very, very hard. You know, debugging parallelized C and Java is even harder. And, you know, how, how, how do you tackle it? How do you program this? You know, are, are today's technologies appropriate? Uh, this is a tweet um, from the founder and CEO of Adaptiva from probably, well, from two years ago, July you know, 2015, where Costas, who should have been here today, unfortunately had visa problems, uh, actually managed to get Erlang's actor model, Erlang's processes, to run on the individual cores of the, the, of the Epiphany chip, on the coprocessor. And once again, very simply, you were able to start a process, the process had to run its sequential code, and then it would send back the data uh, to the ARM processor. So you know, each and one, you know, and they wouldn't be communicating with each other. Um, not, not a big deal, you'd say. Well, the big deal is that you know, the Epiphany coprocessor and the parallel board consumes about three to four watts of electricity, at least a 16 core variant. So no electricity at all. And it's really hard to visualize this stuff. Uh, you know, and even you know, to start thinking on how you tackle these new architectures. Um, you, know, you need a new mindset right here. You, you need a new mindset, you need a new approach, and new ways of thinking. And, you know, there'll be technologies which will actually go in. I mean, there, there's research going on now which will self-discover what hardware it is. It will then take a piece of code and, you know, rewrite it, refactor it, and adapt it and run it on particular chipsets once it's figured out what it should be running on. And 
if, if we just think of, you know, and I think you know, immutability and notion memory remains key to this approach. Uh, just, just think, you know, in our lifetime, I think we'll probably see home computers with a million cores. It's, you know, that's how fast it's going. Andreas, I mean, he has a design for a chip with 1,024 cores, which, you know, he's able to produce, which he did on behalf of, um, of a customer in the States. And, uh, and that's today. So, I mean, we'll be looking at a probably million cores. And if you have a million cores, you'll have a core, you know, the chances of a core failing, you know, increases exponentially. And you'll probably have, you know, a million cores, you'll probably have a core failing every couple of minutes uh, initially. And, you know, with immutable state, you know, handling the failure of a core, you know, becomes exactly the same as handling the failure of a process. It becomes exactly the same model. So, just to, to look at you know, what we discussed here. So we've got immutability. Immutability gives us a particular style of concurrency. There are many different types of concurrency. It gives you a particular style of concurrency based on no shared memory. Once we've got a style of concurrency based on no shared memory, by default, we get distribution. We get distribution at the cost of latency. Now, add multi-core, we also get parallelism. A uh, you know, multi-core, and a distributed, yeah, sorry, a, um, a distributed system is equivalent to a system running on a multi-core architecture, if you think of it. it it's, the, the concept, the analogy is pretty much the same. And, you know, you need distribution when you're dealing with multi-core because of Amdahl's law. Amdahl's law, you know, tells you that your program will be as fast as its slowest component. The slowest component is a sequential code. So, yeah, you can take the parallel code and parallelize as much as you want, but you will still have sequential code. And if you manage, you know, to really kind of make your system truly parallel, you now will still have sequential code in your VM. So you start scaling, you know, truly scaling on multi-cores and cores, you know, with a million, you know, on, on chipsets with a million cores, you will probably need to start running multiple VMs to really get the maximum throughput out. And, you know, as Martin was saying this morning, I think the cost here will be latency, the latency when it comes to message passing. You know, sending a message on the same, to another process on the same core will be very cheap. Sending it to another process on another core but the same chipset is a bit more expensive. Uh, to a process on a different chipset on the same computer, more expensive. A chipset on another computer, even more expensive. So, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, it's important that, you know, based on the semantics of your program and the requirements of your program, you keep latency under control. But there are many cases where, you know, it doesn't really matter as much. And if you do, you know, if you are able to keep latency under control, your system will scale predictably whilst your architecture remains the same. It will be exactly the same architecture, just running, you know, spread out on, on multiple machines. And I think, you know, the biggest showstopper, you know, just scaling on multiple architectures is shared memory and your know, memory lock contention. How do you solve that? Well, pick a language which with no shared memory or pick your favorite language and implement the functional paradigm of no shared memory, of immutable state. Now, once we have uh, distribution and concurrency based on immutability, by default, we get two more things. We get scalability and we get reliability. Call me stupid, it took me 20 years and I had to write two books to actually realize this. We did it. Yeah, we used to go around and tell the world, hey, Erlang's reliable, Erlang's scalable. Uh, not quite understanding why. It, it, it was the case. You know, and the, the reason it's scalable and reliable is the concurrency and the distribution. And I actually had to write, it was my second book when I was writing it, that's when literally the apple fell on my head and I had my ha-ha moment. I was actually formalizing the way we do things and why we do things in a particular way. And, you know, what, when you've got concurrency, what, what you do is when you've got state, you will distribute your state for scale and you will replicate it for availability. And you know, for reliability, you, know, you also need at least two computers. And here, you know, I'll quote Joe Armstrong, it's you need two computers if one might get hit by lightning. Um, if you ask Leslie Lamport, he'll say you need at least three computers here because you know, he wants to figure out and run Paxos on it. But you know, they're, they're both rise, right in their own kind of way. And you know, it's important your know, scalability and reliability needs to be addressed in your architecture from day one. It is not something you can bolt on as an afterthought. It's something you, you need to plan for when you start architecting your system. 
Um, and you know, it's, it becomes very much about trade-offs between consistency and availability of your system. Now, the problem is that the more components you start adding to your distribution, uh, the more likely is the risk of failure. Uh, you increase complexity, you increase hardware, you increase people involved in managing everything. And the beauty of immutable state, and this is actually something I learned from Jonas Bonaire when we, were, you know, we had a brainstorming session. The beauty of immutable state is you know, handling failure on a machine, on a single node, or on a core is handled in the exact same way as a process failing on a local machine. If you know, your message passing is asynchronous, you know, it's exactly the same error handling remotely as it is locally. The only difference is it's going to take a little bit longer to realize something's gone wrong. So assume you, we've got a process in London sending some data to a process in Bangalore, India, asking for a request to compute something. Uh, the things which can go wrong is that the process in Bangalore crashes. Yep. It could be that the beam, the virtual machine in Bangalore, on which the process runs crashes. The machine itself might crash. And the fourth thing which can go wrong is that the network connectivity might go down. And so either we do, can't reach it, or we actually send the request after which the network connectivity goes down. Um, assume, you know, the fifth thing which can go wrong is that we send a request, the request gets managed, handled, we get a response, it gets sent back to London, but we lose it. So because the network goes down. So the actual request has been handled. And the last thing which can go wrong is that, you know, you might get stuck in traffic in Bangalore. It might be, you know, the process might be very, very busy. And London times out and doesn't know the state, doesn't know what's gone wrong. And I think in the last two cases, you know, that's where indepotence comes into the picture. Uh, because you might be executing the same request more than once when retrying. And it's something you need to keep in mind. But the beauty of this is that London handles these errors, even though they're remote, in the same way, exact same way it would handle errors within the same VM. And that simplifies your code. It simplifies your architecture massively because you can write to run on a single machine and then with very little changes or by doing it right from the start, you can distribute globally. You can distribute both on multi-core and elsewhere. Now, what does kind of, in my view at least, the future look like? Where, where are we today? Now, today, what I'm seeing happening out there is that, you know, initially, we abstracted memory management through garbage collection. And I have to say, I kind of disagree with uh, Martin that immutable state complicates the garbage collector. If you've got a garbage collector which only needs to deal with immutable state, it's really, really, really easy to write. Because all you need to do is follow a tree, variables available, you can free it or you cannot free it. There's a great paper which was written by the lab in uh, uh, the early 90s, which I recommend you do. Now, if your garbage collector was written for mutable state, then yes, uh, he is entitled to his gray hair. So first of all, you know, we abstract memory management for the garbage collector. Second is we abstract concurrency through OTP. So we give processes behaviors, but what we're doing now, we're not sending messages or copying data anymore. We're actually calling a function call. And where I'm seeing kind of everything, the direction heading is towards an abstraction of our whole distributed layer through frameworks. Uh, ACA Cluster is an example, React Core, and many, many others. And you know, we've, you know, we've managed to distill it down to a very small set of properties which you need to take care of, which you need to keep in mind. The call you make uh, to the other party either has to be synchronous or asynchronous. If it's asynchronous, it's the fire and forget, so you've got no guarantees that it has received, it has been received by the other end. Uh, I remember you know, a great conversation with Simon Peyton Jones in the pub, where I was trying to make him understand that if you're doing an asynchronous call from A to B and there's a network involved, you cannot have any guarantees. I said, oh, no, no, but we need to have guarantees, he goes. We cannot lose messages. You know, it, was, it was out of his... Uh, 
uh, yeah, but then, it, then it's a synchronous call. Oh, uh, okay, it could be a synchronous call, but yeah, at least the user thinks it's asynchronous. And, you know, and then it's sort of thinking, we maybe need to do a two-phase commit across the network. No, 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 Sam, that's expensive. You know, it's expensive, it doesn't work. You need to accept that if it's an asynchronous call, you send it, you fire it off, and you might lose it. You need to put that in the semantics of your program. And the same, yeah, within a single node. The second part is synchronous. If it's a synchronous request, you send a request, and you get back a response. If you get back a response, great. If you get back an error, you need to decide what to do at that point. That's, that's the failure. And you either have at the most once, so when you get back an error, you don't know the state. You know, it's also called at most once with notification. You don't know the state the other part you know, has been left in because they could have received the message and executed your call, or the message could have been lost in the first place. You can have, ex yeah, sorry, this was exactly once, yeah. Um, uh, if you have, at, le at, at the most once was asynchronous, and at least once, you, know, you send a request, you get back an error response, you try again, and you continue trying on the same process or different processes, different nodes, until you get a response. So those are the ones you know, which, you know, th th those on the client side is what you need to be aware of. And on the server side, or on the process receiving the request, it needs to make a choice whether it wants to serialize the request or parallelize it. Serialize it means that you, know, you change a state. If the ch state changes and you return a new state, the next request coming in will get a copy of the new state. If you parallelize it, you don't know what, you know, what, what state you know, your state is going to be in. You might change it. If you don't change it, you know, it could be HTTP request. You might want to parallelize HTTP requests because you, know, you handle one after which you terminate. You don't retain state in any shape or form. So those are the two simple, you know, th this is the semantics now of uh, computation in a distributed system. And you know, if we start thinking now a little bit of the future, you know, what does the future hold? This is a tweet from 2024, so the first tweet was seven years ago. This one is seven years from now. And I think, you know, the, the future will, yeah, I think, you know, Koch, Agda, and Idris will have the answer to what the future holds. And how many of you are coming back next year to this conference? That's not that many, Naresh, come on. It's <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll have to come back next year to find out what um, affine linear session and dependent types actually mean. Um, research, I think, it's, it's very early days. Research just started in this space. But you, know, it, it's, you can be sure that it will be affecting uh, mainstream languages. It will be affecting currency models. And it will be affecting what we're doing and making us even better. So does anyone have any questions? Yes. I can't hear you, sorry. Thank you, uh, Francisco, for giving us a view into how you see the future. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, I was actually seeing, uh, thinking about uh, how, what the APL guys would respond to that, but that's probably something <laughs> We've had we some can great discussions <laughs> over these last we three days. We yeah. can take that uh, for the next conference.